Hello and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The standard disclaimer applies. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, send questions and comments to our Twitter page at Mason Roundtable or on the Facebook event page for episode 196 pomegranate my name is john ruark past master of the patriot lodge number 1957 in fairfax virginia and with me we have a full house tonight so in no particular order starting with robert johnson robert introduce yourself please hey brother robert johnson here waukegan lodge number 78 waukegan illinois uh, where i am a past master current sitting secretary thanks thank you robert mike the intern welcome mike Hey, Brother Mike Hamburg here, uh, Junior Steward and Lodge Education Officer at Triandria Number 780 in Rock Creek, Ohio, plus also a member of Village Lodge Number 274 in Burton, Ohio. Thank you for joining us, Mike. Mm -hmm. Rocking the best mustache here on the show, Juan Sepulveda. Good evening, everybody. Juan Sepulveda here from Orange Blossom Lodge Number 80 in Kissimmee, Florida, and the host of the Whiny Stairs Freemasonry Podcast. And this is my little friend. Thank you, Colonel. <laughs> Good evening. And last but not least, our very own past master, Jason Richards. One of the past masters on the show. Jason Richards, past master, Vacation Lodge number 16 in Clifton, Virginia, member of the Colonial Lodge number 1821 in Washington, D.C. I spent a whole year in the East, and all I got was this lousy polo shirt. Actually, I had to buy the polo shirt. I got, uh, I got my past uh, master's apron over the uh <clears throat> over the uh the past week so that was that was fun now i just have to wait to get my real past master's apron from dave bacon hurry up dave <laughs> the whole the whole crew is waiting <laughs> good stuff can't wait to see that mm -hmm. well it's gonna be amazing yeah and you left it up to him right you left him to his artistic ability all right um well i uh Florida. I told him my vision for it, and uh, and I probably was a little more strict on my vision than I normally would be. But uh, there's a lot that's going to be left to his artistic interpretation. You know, he can color in the lines that I gave him. And, and it's color by number aprons. Ah, yeah. huh? there's a business model. Ooh. All right, moving on. First Masonic news item as a reminder. If uh, you were there celebrating the 300th anniversary of Freemasonry, holy smokes. This Epileptic <laughs> seizure. <laughs> Let me try that again. I, I'm like, this is straight up like I'm going into a, like a, like a, a, a skeezy Vegas club with the neon lights. Bzz, 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 bzz. Uh, Why the patent? There's on the, uh, YouTube. Tonight on the Masonic rave table. <laughs> Uh, much better. We have. Gee, I thought that had subliminal messages in it saying "buy now." Buy now, get initiated. Uh, you too can own your very own copy of the TMR three hundred commemorative patent, celebrating three hundred years of Freemasonry, um, in celebration of the event that we had in June of this past year. So, go on over, check that out, and it helps out the show. So, thanks a lot. Next up, in a hopefully less raveable, but also hard on the eyes approach, we have the AMD Masonic Week webpage. You can go. It burns. <laughs> it burns. <laughs> the goggles do nothing. <laughs> you can go on over to yorkright.com slash Masonic Week and go check out the schedule of events. It's coming in in one month from today. Jason and I will make random appearances there as well as other Masonic celebrities. So if you're in town, check it out. And you don't have to like really pre-register unless you really want to go into some of the events. So if you have maybe traveling through D.C. Uh, the week of February 8th through 11th, just stop on in at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Crystal City right near the Reagan National Airport and uh, come and say hi. You can't go to anything anyway, so you might as well hang out with us. Right. It's so exclusive, no one can get any degrees from there. No one. And then last I had for Masonic News this week was sent over by our friend and brother from Pennsylvania, Paul Chamberlain. 
past master. Hopefully I got his introduction correct. He sends me the latest Freemason magazine from Pennsylvania in which the new Grand Master for 2018-2019 lays out his plan for membership, recruitment, and retention. And lo and behold, an entire paragraph is dedicated to one-day classes, which Grand Master Herrett states there will not be any statewide one-day classes in 2018 or 2019. Fantastic. Slow, Slow golf clap for show. Oh. So oh, I won't than... have any in 2018 either. <laughs> there you go. I, I just, you know, there's probably, some, well. there's probably some dudes out there who don't like the idea or like, oh, you're cutting this off or whatever. Um, and I don't think anybody, we've been through this before uh, numerous times. And it's just, it's just more of a personal experience for guys to go through not in a one day class. So it's cool. I, like, I feel like, I mean, Pennsylvania already has some, what I consider abbreviated work. <clears throat> so clandestine work. I'll say abbreviated work. <laughs> Uh, and so I don't, I'm like, you going to make it shorter? So, uh, that's pretty rad. And it's kind of in line too. I thought, um, when you mentioned that this was in the magazine, if anybody out there got the new, uh, Southern jurisdiction magazine this, uh, this month, <clears throat> Ronald seal actually was talking about some of the new education things that were happening with, uh, the Scottish right Southern jurisdiction, um, they're going to launch some kind of like online keynote models uh, for larger classes kind of thing. Um, but one of the things he talked about was um, touching on the importance of degree work as an experience. And in the first paragraph of his ad address, it says that uh, he he knows that in Europe and other places around the world, it takes years to become a 32nd degree Mason, whereas here it takes a day. Uh, and he said, you know, it's something to think about, which I just thought was kind of interesting and along the same lines. I'm still waiting for the, <clears throat> the Southern jurisdiction to go kind of full Minnesota and actually start conferring every single degree. I'm sure there are valid. Well, Minnesota is Southern jurisdiction, so. Right, and uh, I was amazed when Nick brought that up. Nick not being a um, Scottish Rite member, but he did say he knows that the Valley up there, they do a degree, I think it's a degree a week, and so it's much easier to spread that out over a long period of time, not burn people out. Um, it's very lean in the sense of the cast only needs to get ready for that one degree, and there's no people filling multiple roles over multiple degrees and, and cramming for a big batch size. And so we're talking talking about the lean six sigma lodge kind of concept spread it out do small pieces <clears throat> for a long period of time and you get a much better uh sense of quality perfection and better experience if i had 29 weeks to go i'd go up there to do that in a heartbeat i agree that that's a really good point okay anything else before we move on to this week's topic this week's topic being the pomegranate. Now, this was a topic that I wanted to dive into um, when I went through uh, the degrees and had the symbol of the pomegranate um, explained to me. I thought it was really fascinating that it, it really kind of stuck, stood out. And I really wanted to dig deeper into not only where it's found biblically as far as how it got into a ritual, but more importantly, what's the, the symbology behind that that we're supposed to take away as speculative masons. And so we've all done a lot of good homework here and in no particular order, I just want to kind of start opening it up for all of us to share some of the research we found and see if we can see some common threads. And so um, Robert being a fan of the illusion mysteries, I thought I'd give him the first at bat to describe what he found. Go ahead. So in a lot of the, well, just, Thinking about the Eleusinian mysteries, there's a lot of different Grecian mysteries. Um, one of them, for example, is uh, the Dionysian mysteries. 
So where you have uh, the Eleusinian mysteries with dealt with Persephone and the seasons, and it's very, um, it's more of a universal type mystery school. Um, in it, the the drink of choice was something called Kaikian or Kaikian, uh, which was uh, like a barley that was mixed with ergot. So they would get kind of poisoned and a little messed up on that and see some wild things during their degree or the, the mysteries class or school. But the, the other one that really existed along that time was the, the Dionysius mysteries, which um, uh, for <clears throat> uh, little kids in the room, cover their ears for a second. The, the, the mystery was called the, the rape of Dionysus. And um, so along with that, there, there's a lot of symbolism that goes along in the, the pomegranate kind of features prominently um, with uh, Dionysus, it's it's known. Um, it, it, it's just there. Like I, I can't really explain why or how, but there are statues of of uh, Jupiter or uh, as he's called Juno. Um, he'll hold a pomegranate. It's talked about as it's being this idea that from the the pomegranate represented, you know, Jupiter's seed, the the multitude of spe seeds that spilled out in in flooded the earth and, and gave rise to humanity, uh, this kind of thing. And it's, as we go through this tonight, one thing I think anybody who's listening out there, and, and the one thing that we realized through all of our research on this topic is um, one word just keeps coming up and up and up. And uh, you'll hear it over and over and over to get, uh, tonight. Um, <clears throat> but it's really just a prominent symbol. I mean, I've got a lot more on it, but we can just kind of pepper it in throughout the show. Okay, yeah, and that, that brings up a good point. Um, really, the, the name of pomegranate really translates loosely to seeded apple, um, where I've even set, found some research that some some Jewish scholars feel that uh, the pomegranate could have even been the, the apple in the Garden of Eden as that forbidden fruit, that, that fruit of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, if you think about that for a for a second, you know, is is it, the kind of the the Anglo-Saxon Christianity movement is is we deciphered the Bible and we put it in like this linear form. There was a need to take some of that symbolism and uh, and make it palatable, no pun intended, for um, the American or you know, kind of the the European of a northern you know, not central to the middle east where kind of those um they're they're lush environments but they're dry so the middle east um you're looking at like nevada and california even now have some areas where they do pomegranates and things but um likely it, it probably was a pomegranate when we think about in terms of what was growing in that region uh, you know if you want to give um, if you want to solidify it in in re terms of reality, right. mm -hmm. good. So let's uh, let's switch over to let's see, Mike. Um, why don't you jump in with uh, some unique research you found as well? Yeah, be related it could be different. Go ahead. Yeah. So what I found was actually in uh, it was a book called The Symbolism of the Three Degrees, Volume Two by uh, Street, O. D. Street. Um, it's uh, the pomegranate, which also adorned the capitals of the pillars, is a symbol of great antiquity, but its meaning seems to have been sacredly guarded. Uh, Posenius, uh, who wrote about it in 150 AD, calls it a Pareto Teros Logos, uh, a forbidden mystery. Um, ancient deities were often depicted holding this fruit in their hands. Uh, Achilles. Statius Bishop of Alexandria says it had a mystical meaning. Um, the Syrians at Damascus anciently worshipped a god whom they called Rhymon. And this we now know to be the Hebrew word for pomegranate. Uh, Cumberland Bishop of Peterborough had a most learned antiquarian guessed that on an account of the great number of its seeds, a pomegranate in the hand of a god denoted fruitfulness or fecundity. 
this corresponds closely enough with the meaning that we as Masons attach to it, that of plenty. And uh, actually I was just now looking too, I found another thing too about uh, some of the uh, healthy uh, uses of uh, pomegranate, uh, you know, the, the, the benefits of it, uh, that it's an antioxidant, it can, lots of vitamin C, uh, is considered a cancer preventative. Um, it helps with uh, Alzheimer's disease protection, the antioxidants and the juice. Uh, it aids in digestion. It works as an anti-inflammatory, so it would help with uh, arthritis. Supposedly it helps with heart disease, blood pressure, uh, because of the, and, uh, the vitamin C and other bo uh, immune boosting nutrients. It, is uh, an antiviral. Um, this one fits right in with our uh, plenty and uh, fruitfulness, the sexual performance and fertility. Uh, then it also supposedly helps great with uh, diabetes. So, um, you know, I mean, those are just some of the healthy you know, possibilities with the stuff. It kind of sounds, Mike, like it's the Masonic equivalent of everybody else's apple cider vinegar. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that would fit. Yeah. yeah. I've heard, you know, there's you can type in pomegranate and like health benefits and it's like crazy huge list and I was debating on whether I wanted to, you know, make notes on that. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, it's going to come up, so somebody will grab it, but Yeah. And I just did I, that I because kept, I didn't really find a lot to begin with. Well, no. I was meeting, you know, uh like there has there's going to be a connection, right, between the health benefits of this when we're talking about its ancient history. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was crazy. Like how many articles you have to get through. If you just type in pomegranate, it's like a million health articles before you get to anything symbolic. Right. <laughs> now, I, I do find the correlation between um, its symbolism of seeded fertility, as well as have, being a fertility, fertility agent. Yeah. I find that to be kind of fascinating. You actually mix the actual health benefit with the symbolic benefit. Well, the question is how much how much of the fertility health benefit derived from it just you know being an aphrodisiac in folklore? You have to eat four million pomegranates in order to <laughs> have one one stamina. <laughs> it just I mean, how it, much it, of that is the sugar just giving you extra energy come on there you go <laughs> it, it's funny i was joking with my wife earlier you know about uh she, she had mentioned the kind of these holistic values of things and she got on the subject of essential oils <laughs> and i said something along the lines of uh essential oils are 100 percent inactive ingredient but are the one active ingredient in why I'm broke. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It, it's like the, um, I have a real, uh, apprehension when it comes to just saying, yeah, the, the pomegranate's going to cure everything. So be careful. It, uh, don't get sold. It's not, I'm not sure it does anything. <laughs> if, well, they had a lawsuit. Palm, palm, wonderful juice had a lawsuit. They weren't allowed to yeah, right. claim anything anymore. Right. Yeah, because well, they back it up. I mean, regardless of the the actual health and fertility benefits, we can all agree that, um, especially in biblical times, it was revered as a, you know, as a symbol of fraternity and really a symbol of of plenty. So when you when you look at how the pomegranate fits in the masonry, it's it's very innately tied into the architecture and the people involved in King Solomon's temple. So it was something that was sewn into the robes uh, that the high priests in the temple wore. Uh, it was something that adorned the, the pillars uh, outside of the entrance to the temple. Um, so, you know, as whether that was, you know, as, as a symbol of fertility or, uh, you know, God's providence and, and God's blessing and, you know, giving his his stewards you know plenty uh you know still a a really really powerful symbol back at least in biblical times yeah, yeah. 
Uh, I was just going to say one of the two kind of interesting notes you talked about uh, Solomon's temple. Um, one of the things I was reading in uh, in Mackey's lexicon, uh, wa- which I think most of that entry is also in the encyclopedia, but he talks about um, that the word that translates into the the uh, the chapters, that word actually didn't mean chapters, and there's a possibility that it actually meant pomegranates. So not that these pillars were adorned with palm. I mean, they were like not just decorated with pomegranates, but the top, that ball, may have been just a giant pomegranate on each one, which was pretty interesting, I thought. Yeah, I read that too in uh, Mackey's. I thought that was great. You know, the great thought, you know. Yeah, like what if all our lodges, you know, have it not wrong per se, but I mean, you know, historically inaccurate based on, it wouldn't be the first time we did something wrong based on a translation. We do it all the time, but I thought it was pretty interesting. You can see Juan has a picture of that up there now of a representation of King Solomon's Temple with the yeah look at that actually representing actual pomegranates and it's said also that King Solomon actually took the uh, the the sprout part of the pomegranate as um, insight into how he shaped his crown as well. So the crown was, was in the same form of uh, the top of a pomegranate. I couldn't find my 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 mute button, but I had something to add regarding the um, the, uh, the chapters of the <clears throat> of the of the pillars. And I've seen many different illustrations. The one that I showed a minute ago shows a very prominent uh, pomegranate on on the top of it. Others, it has been a little bit more subtle. Um, I'm going to try to find some some images of it to share with you. But I wanted to share some something here that I've I found interesting. When we when we talk about symbols, we're talking about always one image that is designed to help you recall a more deep and complex lesson. And the the reason why you would have it as decoration in the robes of the of the priest, and you may have it in the uh, chapters, or you might have it in the walls, or in different places, is to remind you of whatever, whatever it means. So you have that, excuse me, that quick recollection, and ideally modification of your behavior based on whatever lesson is is, is expressed. But I found one ancient Assyrian seal. I'm going to show you that that image right now, and in it which I found interesting, it had, if you see in, this, in the middle of this image, you have a tree of a pomegranate, uh, but it's supposedly depicting the tree of life. So it, it also kind of links up with your earlier description about some scholars believing the fruit to actually be a pomegranate as opposed so, to an apple exactly because apparently as far as i'm concerned it doesn't say apple the translation is a it's a fruit of some kind correct and i'll let you know when i find the other photo of the variations of the of the pillars I was just kind of going through, and I had heard it years and years ago, and while just going through YouTube trying to find some interesting folks, and I wanted to see you know, what, what rabbis had to say about the topic, so I was trying to search for that, and I actually found an interesting video. Um, there was a rabbi who was talking about um, the amount of seeds inside of, a, inside of the uh, pomegranate, um, mimicking the same number of commandments in the Torah. Um, he said 613 seeds and 613 commandments in the Torah. Um, and I thought that was really neat, just kind of the symbolism of it. You know, on average, though, it Are there says, 613? What's that? Are there actually 613 seeds in every pomegranate? No. So there's like between, it depends, right, on the variety. So you're looking at anywhere between 200 and 1,400 on average. So 
it could vary widely, but it is interesting that 613 is kind of right there in the middle. Right. So, so symbolically, yeah. it's kind of a good story to go along with the pomegranate and in the sense of like, and, and who knows, like whoever transcribed the 613 commandments in the Torah, you know, maybe he counted all of the pomegranate seeds that were right there in front of him or something. Yeah. I don't know, but I just thought it was interesting. And I'm always trying to look at like the historical value or like what actually may have happened to influence this story. Um, and most uh, likely they, they basically said, eh, close enough. Yeah. Close enough. <laughs> yep. Um, Another thing I wanted to mention too, I found was interesting was, again, a lot of the um, Jewish studies on uh, the pomegranate also have woven that into study of the Kabbalah. Um, in some texts, pomegranates symbolize the mystical experience in the Jewish mystical tradition of the Kabbalah. Um, and there's even a very popular uh, 16th century text uh, called the Pardes Ramonum, which Ramonum translates to Orchard of Pomegranates. And we're going to talk a little bit about Pardes next week. And we're so, going to talk a lot a bit about Pardes <laughs> next week. Um, so I think it's really it's really a, a neat segue that the Pardes Ramonum, or the Pardes of Orchard of Pomegranates, is, is a symbolic illustration of the mystical experience. Um, in the Kabbalistic tradition. So that, that's a really neat thing to include carrying it forward into the Christian context. Um, it, it doesn't show up a lot in the New Testament, but it does show up a lot in Renaissance art. And so you'll have um, some artwork from Botticelli and Da Vinci where uh, the Christ child or the Virgin Mary will be holding a pomegranate in their hands. And using the symbolism of plenty and um, uh, fullness that really represents Jesus' suffering and resurrection and the fullness of the spirit as well. Cup cup runneth over, that kind of thing. What have you got there, Mike? So here is, it's a Jewish shekel that sold for $1.1 million. It's from one second here, I'll get to the era. Uh, the, from the uh, Bar Kokhba revolt, the second century common era. Um, and it's as you can see on the one on the back side of that shekel is pomegranates. And just because I noticed it was a shekel, you know, we do the half shekel in the uh, uh, Royal Arch, but in any case, you know, uh, I thought that was pretty neat that it was on there from even far as far back as second century. That's really neat. Now, Robert, do you want to go into the myth of Persephone and how she got linked to the pomegranate? Do you have that at the ready? You want to dive into the summary of that mythos? So I can kind of give a, a slight brief overview of that. Um, so within with Persephone, it it's seen as within that kind of spectrum of things, that bubble, um, the pomegranate was seen as this uh, fruit of the dead. Um, and I suspect that has something to do with the fact that within the Eleusinian Mysteries, that's the one that deals with Persephone or Persephone. Um, she eats a reported number of, of these. Um, well, Hades comes and gets her, right? He kidnaps her, takes her to the underworld. And she, while down there, she consumes a certain number of pomegranate seeds. Uh, the pomegranate seeds, again, are revered as this. Uh, they're symbols of what they would call... Uh, the blood of Adonis, or the sometimes it's referred to the blood as the blood of Bacchus, or even Dionysus, um, and so she eats these things, and that permanently links her forever to the underworld. So, um, for half the year she's under the earth, and for half the year she's above the earth. So this is your spring, summer, 
winter, fall kind of thing. Again, the idea of the Eleusinian mysteries was this um, more of a natural, well, it explained the seasons, and that is uh, very in line with many, many of the ancient cultures kind of um, creating a mythos about the, the uh, procession of planets, the equinoxes and the solstices kind of thing. And so that's where she comes into play as far as the pomegranate. She eats the seeds and it, and it keeps her into the underworld. Um, that's where I'll, I'll leave that area of it, I guess. And I'm sorry, I was multitasking. Did you mention about her mother, Demeter? I didn't. No, if you want right, to. So Demeter was the, uh, the goddess of the harvest. And so it was actually a punishment uh, that her, her daughter be stuck in the underworld for either six months or three months, depending on the, the myth, um, and be away. And so as her acting out, she would make the world barren. In other words, during the winter time, she would not allow the harvest to, to be plent plentiful. So that way it became a mythos of the turning of the seasons. Good. Okay. Um, let's see. Next up, Jason, do you have um, another piece of information that we could share? All right. So um, <clears throat> most of most of the interesting stuff that that I found revolved around its its use in um, in the King Solomon's Temple, both in the in the design of it as as well as in the um, uh, and the folks who, who served in, uh, you know, technical term folks, folks who priests who served, uh, with, within the temple. Um, I didn't have a whole lot else to be honest. Robert. Oh, I was just going to say, so some of the kind of cool things that, um, we saw throughout every uh, throughout every system I mean, where wherever the pomegranate was incorporated as a symbol. Um, ancient Egypt used it as a, a symbol for prosperity and ambition. Uh, Greece again, this was th uh, the fruit of the dead. Um, it was also used in modern day Greece. Um, it's used a lot in modern Eastern Orthodox symbols of Christianity. So you'll see um, the. Uh, G um, Jesus's mother holding a pomegranate, or you'll see Mary holding the pomegranate. Um, in the ancient uh, Middle East, again, we've seen it used for the demonstration of fertility. Um, we've talked about it as being the possible forbidden fruit. It's also considered one of the seven spices of the Hebrew tradition, and I don't know a whole lot about that. Um, that was just a, a side note that I had saw. Um, it's eaten during Rosh Hashanah, uh, symbolizes fruitfulness. Um, so we see this overarching theme of fertility and uh, fruitfulness, kind of the multiplication of, of humanity is what it really feels like. Uh, but one of my favorite things that I was reading, and the last thing that I thought I would see was um, in Armenia, it actually has some really interesting... Um, symbology that's used in weddings and things uh, where the bride will throw a pomegranate against a wall and explode it and the seeds would you know represent somehow you know how fruitful she'll be in her marriage with children um, but I, I find it interesting that they have such a rich tradition of it there in Armenia because arguably this is where uh, Ararat is the, the landing place of the ark and you have this idea of it's the symbol of fertility and abundance and marriage in a place that is supposed to be kind of the regenesis of man after the flood. Uh, so I thought it was kind of interesting just in that aspect. Um, China, it's fertility, India, it's prosperity and fertility. Um, I mean, it's kind of wild. You, the only you talked, we talked about actual use as well. So as far as use goes, um, you know, Mike talked about all these health benefits and, and whatnot. The only ancient use I could find for the pomegranate, and this was just on Wikipedia, was that they used it for uh, tapeworms and infections, which 
I don't know how that works, but I thought it was interesting that they had an actual use for it. Um, John, I know you had some really cool information regarding uh, the use as a possible MAOI. Right. Um, I lent my copy of uh, my book to Jason, and he failed me to do the research. <laughs> um, so it's not my fault. My wife moved my book, and uh, I went up to her and was like, hey, where's my, my masonry and drugs book? And she's like, right. So uh, the... A chemically stoned book from P.D. Newman. <laughs> Peter Newman Pete. Um, he um, talks about the use of pomegranates as a possible MAO inhibitor, which um, is a common chemical used to um, allow for the ease of use for psychedelic drugs and atropic drugs to go into the bloodstream quicker, thereby um, having more. Um, endotropic experiences or more hallucinogenic um more um psychedelic type experiences and yeah. so without without an maoi you literally can't have the uptake that you need for things to work like you know the ever inc increasing popularity of things like ayahuasca or um you know some cats out there who just like to get their, their hands on straight dmt whoa um or even, um, as far as I know, like even having chewing coca leaf has to be wrapped in another leaf that's an MAOI. So it has a, a really interesting uh, connotation there, especially with P.D. Newman's other work regarding his talk on the acacia, I think. Right. And so if you think of it like um, if many of you have taken drugs and they'll say, like, don't have grapefruit with it because grapefruit, the acids and the chemicals in the grapefruit will break down the drugs and it won't be as effective. It's the same kind of experience there. Um, for for pomegranate so when you you take the symbolic and chemical aspect of acacia and pomegranate together uh, it, it, there really are some some fascinating correlations there well yeah. there, there are varying accounts um, as to whether or not there's actually DMT present in the bark of the pomegranate plant um, so that's uh, you know it's if anything, it's it's a very very low concentration of of DMT, but uh, you know, I'm I'm looking for for more more than just a, a speculative source on it, and I haven't been able to find it yet. But there's at least speculation that there there are low levels of DMT in the in the bark of the tree. Yeah, cool. that's wild. Uh, the the last um, note that I have here switching gears, um, switches forward into Islam and Sufism. And uh, another piece of research I found that the Sufism Saint Ali said that, quote, the light of Allah is in the heart of whoever eats pomegranates. And even Muhammad has been known to say, quote, the pomegranate cleanses you of Satan and from evil aspirations for 40 days. Uh, so wow. that that's an interesting thing, especially when you translate that toward the 40 day cleansing, which is a common theme through the Judeo Christian Bible as well. The 40 days wandering in the desert, the 40 days that you know Jesus was, was um, on his own. A 40 day flood. Mm -hmm. Spoken by a guy who's done his research. <laughs> <laughs> or in the. Well, that's only, that's only one of the. Uh, two accounts given in the Bible that was 40 days and 40 nights. Sorry, Robert, what? I was, I was going to say there, there's the, the Kogi Indians who have a four, who say it rained for four years. So it's different than 40, but I'm just going to hit it with four. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jason, what are they saying on social media now? All right. We've had, uh, we've had a lot of good conversation on social media tonight. So I'm going to start off as soon as the page loads. With... And while that happens, I mentioned very quick, thank you okay. for all of those who have been participating on the YouTube chat and keeping it kosher. Uh, I really appreciate it. Some people have been chiming in that they watch <laughs> while they drive. Let's see what I did. Careful. <laughs> yeah. We do not endorse that. Good plan. We watch don't not you... endorse that, but we don't endorse it. Yeah, watch while you drive. It's really fun. Thanks. 
Uh, so starting off with uh, with brother Donnie Dillon, he says, "Ah, oh, the pomegranate, the most fecund of fruits." And John apparently got fertile. it. Hmm? Fecund meaning fertile. Yes. Um, so uh, brother Scott Sherman said, uh, "I'll leave this here for now." Did you know why the pomegranate is so featured through Judaism? Again, we touched on this. It's because the fruit is said to have had 613 seeds, the same number of commandments in the Torah. And if you ever get to Jerusalem, get some fresh squeezed pomegranate juice. It's heaven on earth. Sounds good. And uh, brother brother Donnie is, is also hoping that the uh, Scottish Rite Southern jurisdiction goes full Minnesota. And that's actually uh, all we've got on social media tonight. I need Ohio to go full minutes. It's not not as and... feckoned on social media as, as I thought tonight. I, I do want to give a, a plug for Al Leathers, who did share uh, a copy of the Botticelli artwork um, of Jesus in Mary's arms holding the open, fruitful pomegranate. So I think that's a, a really good image there uh, that, that describes that that Christian spin on the fullness, um, the symbol of plenty, as it were. Okay, with that, let's wrap things up and starting with Mike, the intern, bring us home okay. with the final thoughts. So, um, you know, I did find something more with the thing with the seven uh, from the Hebrew stuff that uh, RJ was talking about, uh, about the pomegranate. You know, the Hebrew word for pomegranate we already discovered was Ryman. Uh, many references containing it are found in the Old Testament. They are usually associated with the fruitfulness of the land, along with grapes, figs, olives, barley, and wheat. Uh, these were the riches that Moses pledged to his people when he led them out of Egypt into the promised land. And to this day, Jews employ pomegranates in certain religious ceremonies. So, um, and, you know, we already know about them being woven into Aaron's robe and so forth. But uh, I just thought that was neat there to point that out about the uh, pomegranate, again, about the seven, Israel's seven species. So, but, uh, yeah, I, I found this uh, episode quite plentiful. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mike. Let's switch over to Robert Johnson. So it was a wild kind of episode because we all just went nuts and tried to find everything we could on this thing. Um, if you just go out and you type it, like I said, if you just type in pomegranate on Google, you're going to really, you have to sift through information. And really the only text inf textual information that you can find is going to be like in the lexicon or in Mackey's encyclopedia. Um, as far as I'm, I know it doesn't appear in Waits new encyclopedia of Freemasonry. It doesn't appear, um, you know, I've got several books back there on ancient religions and there's no, you know, uh, index of pomegranate. So without like, you know, reading the entire book, I, I can't find and cherry pick some quotes, but, uh, what we did find I felt was really fascinating. I love the fact, I love tying the symbol into actual um, usage um, somehow and not just like philosophical usage. Uh, I do love that, but I also love knowing what this did in real time. Um, so, you know, in my mind, I look at things, I'm a huge fan of <clears throat> the ancient mysteries as they were. Um, and I think that through that, I mean, there was probably some element of the pomegranate that, that was ritually used in, um, in some fashion or form. And I think it was probably more, it symbolized something because it probably did something. Um, and, and I'm not saying that I'm a hundred percent on board with it being an MAOI in the use of, you know, um, you know, taking dimethyltryptamine uh, in, in an ayahuasca type drink or something. But I do think it probably had something, um, you know, to do as far, you know, some sort of factual use 
that it, it gave rise to, um, you know, it's, it's symbolry in, in being uh, used and, uh, for fertility and all these other things. Uh, I read as a, when I was a teenager, I was reading a book about, uh, ancient, um, biblical times. And they talked about the pomegranate being, um, the symbol of the, the, the words they used then were, uh, virility, um, you know, the strong man kind of thing. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and then to come into a show, you know, whatever it is, 30 years later, uh, now, and, and we read all about it and we do all this research and, and it just boils down to this fertility aspect, which was just fascinating to me. It's almost the universal symbol for, for that. So, um, thanks for watching and, and learning along with us and, uh, everybody out there who's on YouTube and who's on Facebook, uh, leaving the comments and stuff. Thanks for leaving us all that like the extra and filling in some of the gaps. Um, if you're listening, I would love if somebody would fill me in on the seven spices of uh, Hebrew tradition. I didn't find a whole lot on that. So um, thanks in advance. Uh, if you like Masonic podcasts, check out Wentz Caney, Sunday nights, 930. And of course, uh, Masonic Curators, which is a new uh, YouTube show we're doing. Um, so if you've got something to show off, show it off and we'll, we'll get it up on the uh, program. We've got Steve Harrison and Greg Knott have been doing videos and it's pretty rad. So thanks everybody. We'll talk to you all next time. Thank you, Robert. All right, Juan, you're up next. All right. Well, uh, it's no mystery that I've been a little bit quiet cause I didn't have much to contribute. Uh, but I found it to be fascinating. All these there were a lot of theories, a lot of things that are just speculative. But when you really think about it, the archaeological record of King Solomon's temple and the, you know, the things happening around that time, it, they're very scarce. You know, there's very uh, far and few in between. So, but it's interesting. I, I, I do love to to learn a little bit more about the, the little details in the symbolism. Uh, like you've heard, just don't think that... The details are insignificant and can be just edited out of our ritual or our practice because even simple things as one symbol of a fruit as being part of the the ritual part of the adornments of the lodge could have a great uh significance so thank you all for watching and uh we've heard some of the comments that happen on on youtube that people also listen to the show using their playstation so if you've never tried that, you have a PlayStation, you might want to check that out. At least two people tonight mentioned that they listen through the PlayStation. I, I found that to be surprising. Nice. Yeah, right? And for that brother that's listening to this and has no idea what images we flashed on the screen, I encourage you to go to youtube.com forward slash the Masonic Roundtable. And after you subscribe, check out the video so you can see all the pictures. And if you haven't subscribed, we have a lot of brothers that actually just go to the go to the uh, through the link and just watch the videos. If you subscribe, you help us reach other brothers that perhaps have never heard of of what we do. And if you find anything of value in our show, please do that for us. A thumbs up on the episodes and a subscription goes a long way. So we appreciate your effort for that. And that's it for me. Thank you, brothers. Uh, make sure to go to thewindingstairs.com. Check out some of the latest products we have there. Uh, we're going to start the year 2018 with some more episodes. Uh, I know I've fallen behind on, on production, but 2018 has some fun stuff lined up. So I want you to be a part of them. Take care, brother. Thank you, Juan. All right, Jason Richards. So in uh, in Masonry, the, uh, uh, the lecture um, that's a uh, part of the fellow craft degree is, is by far my favorite. Um, and that, that is one of the areas where, where we learn about the pomegranate and, and Freemasonry. So, you know, the, the symbolism of the pomegranate has, has been kind of, has made a, a lasting impact on me just, just through my love of that degree and my love of that lecture. And I think it's, it's just a beautiful symbol that doesn't get enough face time in masonry and and in the masonic ritual um just because it, it can be viewed as it's it's such an ancient symbol it is is such a powerful symbol and it's it's a great symbol that um really can be used as um 
you know, as, as a very real um, facet of, of God's promise to to keep us safe and, and provide for us. Um, so it's it's pomegranate as, as a symbol has always been, you know, something that uh, I've really been drawn to. So having an episode where we get to talk about it and talk about, you know, it's it's rich history as as a religious symbol and whatnot um, is awesome. So I, I love the fact that even even if certain symbols don't get prime time in Masonic tenets and Masonic rituals, uh, there are there are so many little tangents that we can go down and and so many allusions to to other things in the Masonic ritual. Uh, that we literally kind of never run out of things to to talk about, which is why we're going, you know, four years strong at the uh, come next month. So um, that's pretty much all I've got. If you guys are interested in seeing a special open uh, ceremony uh, that the Grand Lodge of Virginia is conducting, you can tune in to our YouTube page on Saturday. The Grand Lodge is doing a building dedication, which is an open ceremony open to the public. They're doing that at my lodge, Acacia Lodge, in honor of our 140th anniversary of our chartering. And I'm going to be live streaming that. So if you're interested in getting a glimpse into how the Grand Lodge of Virginia does uh, does public ceremonies and does ritual, uh, check it out. It's going to go live at about uh, 1045, 1050 Eastern Standard Time on Saturday morning. That's Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, in closing, I think it's fascinating. Every time we've, we've been doing the show for almost four years, and I learned something new about Robert tonight about how he approaches a lot of this, uh, the, these symbols that, that we we come across, and how he tries to look for the historical, practical kind of connotations and applications thereof. And 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 I I approach it similarly yet differently in the sense of when I see a lot of these symbols. Um, I try to find some of the historical context, uh, but in in more of a um, symbolic way, and and try to figure out what does it mean, not so much practical or where this came from historically or where you know it got introduced, but what does it mean for the human condition, right? And and how do we interpret uh, that in our daily lives? Um, and then I want to see what what are the similarities over time and across cultures. And and Robert did a great job looking at some of the um, similar aspects of the pomegranate across multiple cultures across multiple centuries and and i try to internalize that figure out does, can that describe who we are um what we came here to do and what are we going to do after we shuffle off this mortal coil um, so hopefully uh, you've reached a, a little bit of enlightenment tonight as i know i sure did and we thank you guys for going on this journey with us um, we'll see you next week. So thank you very much for watching and keep searching for more light. Have a good night.